Zen meditation is considered to be a practice out of which through consistent practice over time you, you wake up, you become, you, uh, be, you become enlightened, you become awake, you become aware. And in Zen meditation, it's, it's, uh, they really emphasize the simplicity of the practice to, to stay away from all of the mental activity and the idea that you're doing something. Uh, and so, but, but nonetheless, they say that you should uh, understand there are certain things, keeping your back straight, uh, keeping your feet flat on the floor if you're in a chair, um, and uh, relaxing the body, breathing from the belly. So when you inhale, the, the, and belly breathing is healthy breathing. It's not just about meditation. Breathing from the chest is unhealthy. So that's something you want to practice uh, anyway. You know, when you inhale, your, your belly expands, and when you exhale, your belly goes in. So, uh, and then breathing front, through the nostrils, not through the mouth, breathing in and out through the nostrils, and also resting the tongue on the roof of the mouth. This is another thing that, um, and the reason for that is because if you rest your tongue on the roof of the mouth, it, it lim eliminates a, a lot of salivation, so you don't have to keep swallowing, right? Uh, but the thing about the, 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 the method and the techniques is it's not something that, you know, in, in the beginning of establishing a practice, it's the kind of thing that you want to give some attention to, you know, before you, be, before you go ahead and sit, so that that becomes something that you don't have to think about at all. You just know that your back should be straight, you know that you should let your body relax, et cetera, and the breathing and so forth. And after a while, you, you know, you don't have to think about doing those things. Uh, so yeah, and, and the thing is this, so does that help, does that answer? Yeah. See, the thing about meditation is that it is, especially if you approach it from a Zen perspective, right? Uh, it, is, it is a practice with the intention, and in the beginning of practicing meditation, it's challenging for most people. So if you, you know, it, and I'm, you know, those of you who have been coming to the class for a while know what I'm talking about, because you, if you've been coming to the class for a while, and especially if you've been practicing meditation consistently, then you know, then you can see the difference that it makes, that it gets easier. It's not, it doesn't stay difficult all the time, you know, in the beginning, the mind is restless, the body is restless, it doesn't want to be still, the mind doesn't want to lose your attention, right? But as time passes, that begins to adjust. And in this form of practice, the purpose of it from a Zen perspective uh, is enlightenment. And so, you know, I, the, the way I look at it is that if I just were to, to teach meditation as a stress reduction uh, technique, and the way I see that, that's like selling you knockoff Nikes, right? You know what knockoffs are, right? It's like selling you knockoff Nikes, right? Because that's not the real thing. That's not what meditation really is intended for. Meditation is intended for your coming, going through an evolution psychologically and emotionally. It's for coming out of a dream state. It's from coming out of a sleep state. It's from waking up and seeing who you are and seeing how it is, seeing reality for what it is, it is. And so that's the reason why I say to you, you know, have, have it be your intention to be enlightened. Have it your intention to, be, to reach nirvana. Nirvana is the, is the word that's used often in Buddhism and what nirvana means, the end of suffering. If it's possible to end your suffering, why wouldn't you do that? You know, I, even if it's not that easy to do, but nonetheless it's possible, why wouldn't you do that, right? So nirvana means the end of suffering. Enlightenment is also the end of suffering. It also has a connotation of that enlightenment means that you discover your true nature, your Buddha nature. You discover who you really are. You discover that what you really are is the awareness that has been there all along, being ignored most of the time, that's called ignorance. But in both cases, 
the other reason that, that I say what I say about, you know, I encourage you to seek nirvana, I encourage you to, to seek to be enlightened, to be a seeker for these things, because as a psychologist, I know that this is more psychotherapeutic than psychotherapy. If you do it consistently and you do it correctly, and, and especially if you have a guide, right? This is, a, this is, I'll tell you, I shouldn't say this, but this is free psychotherapy. I'm a clinical psychologist. So you are, you are getting free psychotherapy by coming to this class and practicing meditation and, and, and being guided in that practice and being given the teachings that go side by side with the practice that if you take those teachings to heart, not just to mind, but if you take those teachings to heart and if you practice consistently, you will begin to notice that the way you see things starts to change. The way you see things starts to change. The way you see your own mind, thought processes starts to change. The way you, you, the way you experience emotions begins to change. And if you stay the course, and one of the reasons that I say these things is because you know, yesterday in, on the Zoom, on Wednesday evenings at five o'clock, I do a Zoom meditation practice, and yesterday I was talking about enlightenment there. Right? And the reason that I talk about that is because one of the things that comes up for people in regard to these practices and having a teacher is, is the teacher enlightened, right? Is the teacher enlightened? And the thing about it is that, you know, that opens up a conversation about enlightenment, and I think it's a useful conversation to have for a number of different reasons. But the reality of it is, you know, well, what does that mean? And, the, and one of the reasons that I say that you should seek enlightenment and you should seek nirvana is because in my own process, in my own experience, in my own life, that's what I did, and it worked out. It worked out. So. Uh, it, you know, if you say to me, are you enlightened? Well, I want to really make enlightenment ordinary, right? So if I say I am, when I'm, when I'm, I'm not saying I'm a saint. I'm not saying that I'm special. I'm saying that I do know who I am. I do experience being awareness itself. And at this point, uh, the, the amount of time in my life that I spend exper uh, ex experiencing suffering is very, very little, very, very little. And that's compared to a time in the past when, when I look back at it, the reality was that my life was suffering 24-7. Because if you don't know who you are and you don't know the truth, then that's going to be the life you're experiencing because you're going to be Identifying yourself as the voice in your head, that'll, that, 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 that alone will cause plenty of suffering, right? You're gonna identify yourself as the voice in your head, you're gonna feel separate from the world, you're gonna feel separate from all the people around you in your life, you're gonna be paranoid, you're gonna be fearful, you're gonna be concerned, you're gonna have a, 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 a lack of control over your emotions, right? You're gonna worry, you're gonna regret things in the past, you're gonna be afraid of things in the future. This is the state of mind that humanity lives in, right? And so until and unless you begin to wake up and, and see things as they are, life is suffering. That was the first noble truth from the Buddha, life is suffering. And when he said that, what he meant, he didn't mean that life is inherently suffering, right? No, he meant life is suffering for humanity given the condition that they're in. The way they're experiencing life is suffering. And so I know from those of you who have been coming to class consistently, I'm assuming, and I'm not even assuming, I'm pretty certain that you wouldn't come as consistent as you do, right, if it wasn't for the, uh, that, that you see what I'm pointing at, that, that you recognize what I'm pointing to. Or, or even more than that, you've, you've, you've experienced the difference it can make. You've had times in your life since you've been practicing meditation and coming to this class uh, where you have noticed that you didn't allow the anger to run you. You didn't act out. You weren't being stupid. You didn't keep, a, you keep, you didn't keep repeating a, the same pattern. You could get over something faster than you did in the past. That's called resilience, right? Just like, you know, when we were practicing earlier, meditation earlier, these are the kinds of things you notice 
you know, as you continue to experience the benefit of meditation and the benefit of consistently paying attention to reality. You know, when we were practicing earlier, I don't know how many of you noticed, but my phone rang, okay? Yeah. So the way that that occurred for me was I recognized it ringing, right? I immediately went to decline the call and then went back and went right back into meditation. Whereas there, there, would be, there, there would be another time in my life when something that small could happen and it would ruin the day. This is the difference, you know? There are people that have an incident that occurs in their life and it ruins their entire life. Their entire life, one incident ruins their entire life. Or people that don't talk to other people in their family for years because of one thing that was said one night. This is insanity. It's insanity. And so, you know, the, the reason why I encourage people to seek nirvana and seek enlightenment, not only is it because it's possible, because unless you do that, you're insane. You're insane. This is about going sane. Hmm? And the other thing about enlightenment is that I, I want to really take away the specialness of that. You know, there's a lot of bullshit about it, you know, where people get into this guru shit and you know, and then you see this stuff online. We were talking about this last night in the class. You see these, this stuff online about who's a real guru and who's not a real guru and who's a lineage holder and, you know, who's a fake. And, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I'm not interested in all that stuff, you know. When you begin to understand what this is all about, that's not, none of that's relevant anymore. If there are people out there teaching and, and the, what they have to say and how they say it is useful, fine, that's good, that's valuable. After, other than that, it doesn't matter. Because once, at, at some point, you begin to realize that the real guru is you. The real guru is you. Even in people who are uh, practicing a devotional approach to meditation from India, you know, where they have a guru, right? Even within that context and that understanding, right, it needs to be understood that the, that the guru that you're giving your devotion to, the guru that you're, that you're surrendering to, is a projection of the awareness that is you, is a projection of your, who you really are, you see. And so the more you recognize that, the more you, 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 you can get the benefit of a guide or a teacher, right? But you don't have to uh, get lost in the idea you know, that, that you do whatever they say to do, or, you know, you just give up your, your will to them. That gets crazy, you know? I mean, you, anybody looks into these things, there's plenty of situations where that kind of thing happens and it gets crazy. But that doesn't take away from what this is all about. And one of the things that I've said about this uh, in the past is that if, if you, get the, if you get the idea, if you recognize what this is, okay, the evidence that you recognize what this is and the evidence that you practice meditation consistently is that you begin to make it a priority in your life. You begin to give it the attention that is required in order for it to blossom, in order for it to come to fruition. Yeah, because to be realistic about all this, you know, you, where you start out is crazy. You start out from being crazy. You start out from being conditioned like almost everybody's conditioned. And what I mean by that is you think you're your body, you think you're the thinker of the voice in your head, you think your story is the truth, you, know, you think the way things appear to be is the way they are. That's, that's the craziness and the conditioning that most of humanity is living in. And the more, you, the more you see things as they are, the more you study these teachings, the more you see what they point to, the more obvious it is that the world is in a crazy condition. And the thing that's interesting about this is that as you continue to practice, whether we're talking about the, your own craziness or the craziness around you, as you begin to practice and you start to come out of it, start to come out of the conditioning, Everything is the same. See if you can, those of you who have been coming for a while and been practicing, see if, you, see if you get what I mean by this. 
as, as you begin to wake up and see things as they are, as you begin to be what you are as awareness itself, everything is the same, right? But everything is different. Nothing changes, but everything is different. You, 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 the same situations you look at and you're seeing them differently than you used to see them, right? You're seeing them with different eyes. That's why they call people in, in some places, they call people who are, are enlightened or people who are awake seers. They call them seers, right? Because you can see. That's what it was meant when they said, you know, the blind leading the blind, right? that you can't see because you're blind, your eyes are blind. And you start to wake up, you begin to see things as they are, and one of the things you see, it starts to get interesting because one of the things you see is that you've always been free. Who you really are has always been free. So it's not that you're going to be free, you are free, you've always been free. All you have to do is start paying attention to the truth. All you have to do is start being what you are and you experience who you are and you experience the freedom that is there. It's not an achievement. It's not something that's going to happen. It's something that's always been true. This is the kind of thing you begin to see and you begin to see who you've been being and what you've been preoccupied with in terms of paying the kind of attention you pay to the mental states and the emotional states and how much reality you give to all of that and how you thought that was all real and the story that you tell yourself is real and the story that other people tell is real. As you begin to wake up, you see through that, you see through it. And you realize that it is possible for you to stop giving that attention and relating to that as if it's reality and instead give attention to the truth, which is what you really are and have been all along that is free that can see things clearly, and that opens up a whole new world of possibility. And as this process continues, as these things begin to occur, it becomes easier and easier to be a meditation practitioner. It becomes easier and easier to be somebody who gives attention and time to continually listening, listening to these teachers. And, and you, have, you have the benefit now of having it all available to you more than ever before, more than ever, never in the history of humanity has humanity had the availability that you have right now to these teachings. Just on the internet. I mean, I, every single day, I spend time listening to different people teach and, and I have, have not come to an end yet in terms of, of, of coming across new people. And to me, if there's no end to my interest and my excitement when I listen to these people and I hear either a new variation, you know, a new way of talking about, you know, what this is, right? Or a verification that what I see is being seen by somebody else, right? And what I see and what somebody else is seeing is what was talked about in the Bhagavad Gita, it was talked about in the Pali Kanan, it was talked about in the, in the Tao Te Ching, it was talked about in all these ancient wisdom teachings. There is this consistent truth that runs through the whole thing. Nothing to me is more interesting and fascinating and amazing to that, you know, to, than that. And, and the fact that, that the, and, and the fact that these teachings and these, this truth is still so unknown, still so unrecognized, still so unpopular is, is, is also an amazing thing, you know, given what it offers people. But what that, what that tells us, what that tells us is that this, this dream, this illusion, this conditioning that exists is so pervasive and so, so complete hmm? uh, that what we speak of here to most people is, is, is navel gazing, you know? What we speak to up, up here to most people is weird, you know? I, I'm sure there are people that walk by this room out there and look in and say, oh wow, look at that. <laughs> look at those people, they're just sitting there. How stupid. <laughs> Right? Because in the world we live in, that's how things occur to people, you know? Oh, I'm not going to just sit there. That's stupid. I'm going to go work out, right? 
But you see, you know, as you continue to learn and practice these things, you experience compassion, right? And you realize that if these people knew, if every, if, if humanity really knew the truth, right? They would be very interested. But we live in a world, you know, where you can, you can get a prescription, right? You don't have to sit here. You're, you're anxious, you don't have to sit here and be uncomfortable. Get some Xanax. Right? Or, or even better yet today, smoke some pot. Right? Pot's legal. Or if, wherever it's not legal, nobody's paying much attention anymore anyway. Right? So you have, you have the, those, those uh, ways to deal with things, and, and those ways to deal with things undermine the truth. You know, they undermine the truth. They, they take away the possibility of your experiencing your natural state, you know, which is not anxious. It's a shame in a way that people become so dependent and then their bodies have to deal with all the side effects of, you know, uh, being artificially controlled like that. Okay, so um, I just want to acknowledge you for being here and for being willing to look at this and practice this and take responsibility for your life. I feel comfortable in promising you that, you, that you, you, you've, you've made a good choice. You've made a good choice and it will pay benefits, you know? And it's, it's uh, like I said before, it's free psychotherapy. So, you know, take advantage of the opportunity. I'm not gonna be here forever, you know? I ain't a kid anymore, right? And I'm not gonna be here forever. And when you come upon opportunities like this, make sure you take the opportunity, you know, don't waste it. Okay, have a good night.